Good afternoon for uh, everyone. Um, thank you, uh, Huwei. I think I, I'm going to show the same slides, but uh, you know, trying to demonstrate exactly the opposite you just said. And um, this is my disclosure. When we uh, when we talk about routinely invasive or selective invasive, you should uh, at first uh, you know uh, do the definition because. Uh, Routine invasive strategy means that the patient is deemed to undergo coronary angiography, while in the selective invasive strategy, coronary angiography is only performed after recurrent symptoms, objective evidence of inducible ischemia or non-invasive testing, or the detection of uh, uh, obstruction, uh, uh, obstructive CAD uh, seen by CCTA. Uh, what, show, what is shown in this slide is that uh, multiple of uh, now, multiple randomized clinical trials and their meta-analysis comparing a routine and selective invasive approach for patients with non-ST elevation myocardial infarction showed a significant reduction of uh, composite ischemic endpoints uh, and particular cardiac death and MI with the routine uh, then uh, selective uh, uh, invasive uh, strategy. So, and this is a uh, you know, already clear. While uh, uh, if you see the, the, the point that we need to discuss now is uh, the time for angiography. So there is a, or no, no, no issue why the, started, the invasive strategy is needed, but the time is already not, has not been really uh, clarified. While this is a slide that uh, who I already showed, but if you uh, and now, if you analyze this slide, you can see that uh, multiple randomized, randomized trials have uh, um, investigated the optimal timing of a coronary angiography and revascularization. And uh, the main limitation for the interpretation of this randomized trial is the calculation of time of angiography, which rather than being based on a pain onset or on hospital admission time, was based on randomization time. And this is an important issue. And while it was visually always performed within 24 hours of randomization in the yearly invasive strategy groups, as you can see here on the left, in the time from uh, in the in, in the time from uh, uh, randomization to coronary angiography was more heterogeneous, as you can see here, in the delayed invasive groups. And the one of the main message that can be derived from uh, uh, these randomized uh, clinical trials and uh, uh, that is reported by the current guidelines uh, is that uh, among unselected NST elevation ACS patient, a neural invasive strategy is not superior to delayed invasive strategy with regard to composite clinical endpoints. And uh, as you can see here, the analysis of pooled data confirmed that uh, there is a lack of differences between early and delayed strategy in terms of main ischemic endpoints, such as all cause mortality and MI. However, early approach was associated with the lower risk of uh, refractory ischemia. And along the same line, in the time as trial, as you can see in this slide, ill intervention reduced the, the occurrence of composite of death, MI and stroke, or refractory ischemia, while it did not affect the outcome when refractory ischemia was not included in the composite endpoint compared to the delayed strategy. And uh, this is a, an important point too. And also by adding another component to the composite of uh, ischemia, ischemic event, so this is a re-hospitalization uh, for, the, for the heart failure, again, yielded no difference between early and delayed strategy. And also, in addition, the pooled analysis of verdict and the TIMAX, uh, benefit with early invasive strategy was associated with the, uh, the patient risk profile, and in particular was greater for the patient with the grade score more than 140. And also, if you see several meta-analyses that, that have been pulled data for all the mm, multiple randomized trials, assessing different timing, as you can see here, 
uh, for the uh, intervals of coronary angiography, none of them observed a benefit with a nearly invasive strategy with respect to the endpoint of that non faral major stroke among uh, selected patient for NST elevation patient. So, another message from the randomized trial that we have between ill and delayed treatment is that the benefit with the neural invasive strategy is strongly associated with the, the patient risk profile. And uh, if you see this data in, the, in, the, in this um, specified subgroup analysis of the TIMAX trial, as you can see in this trial that we've been already shown, Patient with a risk risk score uh, more than 150 uh, benefit from uh, an early invasive strategy, while those with a risk score risk before you know uh, less than 150 did not. And uh, with regard of the risk score, another point is that it must be highlighted that uh, both of both the 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 uh, RST, uh, RST um, uh, clinical trials calculated the original GRACE risk score for in-hospital death. So furthermore, in both studies, GRACE score uh, calculation was based on the elevation of CKMB uh, or conventional troponin. And the value of GRACE risk score more than 150 to guide timing of uh, angiography and revascularization in the area of uh, you know, troponin was not being uh, uh, addressed. And uh, this is, uh, this, those, those are the data of uh, a, a collaborative meta-analysis that have been comparing the early and the immediate invasive and uh, to a delayed invasive uh, uh, strategy using uh, uh, a modified individual patient data approach and observe that uh, survival benefit in any patient, although tests for the interaction were uncomfortable not conclusive. So this is another important point too. So another message, the third message is that uh, the benefit uh, with the nearly invasive strategy is not modified by ST segment T wave change, despite the fact that the ST depression has been consistently identified as a predictor for an, uh, an adverse outcome. In uh, this study that I want to show you, this is study based on the evaluation of uh, infarct sites at uh, the MR, patient with uh, transit transient ST segment elevation and the relief of symptoms and immediate um, invasive strategy also did not reduce the CMR assessed lymphocytes when compared to the nearly invasive strategy. So this is another point that we need to consider. So this is my last time. And uh, what I want to, you know, to say is that uh, we really go to need, uh, you know, need to go very fast and early in a very high risk patient, but, but for the rest of them, uh, just, uh, we go just late. Thank you for your attention. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Giovanni. Uh, uh, it's time for uh, Q&A. Uh, I would like to uh, ask you, uh, uh, to both of you, to f first question. Don't you think that actually um, it depends on uh, the facilities that you have at your own center in routine practice? Either you have a cat lab available and you're going to send the patients rapidly to the cat lab, or you don't have it, or you have waiting list and you're going to have a slow approach. And if this is the case, you know, the debate is a little uh, academic because uh, obviously it depends on, on your facilities. And when you work in a big center with big volumes and plenty of cat labs open 24 hours a day, it's easy to bring the patient to the cat lab. When you are far away from this type of, of, of hospital, it's more difficult to bring the patient to the cat lab. And I know countries in Europe 
where we still have waiting lists for the cat lab. What do you think, Uwe? Yeah, agree. I think uh, in our hospital, we, we have cat labs available and we try to do it as, as fast as possible for the reasons I have uh, already mentioned. On the other hand, uh, if there is no cat lab uh, ready available, I think uh, you have to select patients on their risk. And uh, it's clearly that uh, the higher risk patients sh should uh, undergo uh, immediate uh, angiography at the first time. Um, with respect to alternative methods uh, um, as uh, CT, for example, we just have seen a, a study uh, at AHA where CT was not improving uh, outcome if done before angiography. So I still think that angiography is the way to go. Giovanni? Yes, I mean, I fully agree. I fully agree because uh, actually, I think this, this debate is important for the spoke centers, which, uh, you know, you don't have, uh, you don't have possibility to do angio to, to choose to do very, very early. So I think uh, it's the same, uh, the same debate that is for the, for the upstream or downstream, uh, you know, treatment for the, for the antithrombotic therapy. Because if you go fast, there is no way to discuss. Because if you go fast, uh, is, uh, everything is almost useless uh, because you, do, you have to do the, the angio as soon as possible. But the problem and the, 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 the strategy that we, on which depend the outcome of the patient is when you don't have facilities, you have a spoke center that is you know, in a timing late and uh, this, this is uh, really the, the, the patient that we need to discuss. Yes, um, I'm pretty confident that anywhere in Europe, where, where, where if you have a very high risk patient, it will be transferred to the cat lab rapidly. For the others, it, if it's difficult, it may wait. Is a CT scan a, a, a possibility? I, I'm going to ask Jean-Philippe to answer this question because, of course, it is in the guidelines. Uh, my, my, my take on this is that if you don't have a cat lab, you may not have a CT scan for a coronary scan. Yeah. Well, in the guidelines, it, it is highly uh, recommended, especially in the low risk. And we have the, the, the verdict uh, CCTA, a sub-study which was recently published showing that uh, the predictive positive uh, value of a CT scan in uh, uh, those patients with uh, high risk uh, um, non-S elevation SES is the same, uh, about uh, 95 to 96%. So, which, so it's quite reassuring. And the second uh, uh, point is that um, uh, we have also uh, German studies uh, showing that uh, if you have uh, uh, CCTA available on site, then you avoid about 36% of uh, unwanted uh, invasive coronary angiography. So I think it's, it's time for spoke centers when, uh, where you do not have uh, you know, on-site uh, um, uh, cat lab facilities uh, to uh, invest uh, on CCTA uh, because it's very useful. And I think that the next step is probably you know, the uh, elderly patients, uh, you know, in whom uh, CCTA needs, uh, you know, uh, additional evidence. And this is what we have said in the guidelines. Yeah, I agree with respect to the low risk population. So uh, hemodynamic stable, uh, no risk factors. In, in these cases, uh, CCTA might be a good choice, but if you have a 60 year old smoker, then this is coronary artery disease and nothing else. So I don't see a value to go in between for a CCTA. So I think uh, it's the high risk population and this high risk population uh, should undergo an invasive approach while the low risk, maybe CCTA might be a, a possibility, but uh, usually this uh, technique is not available in smaller centers, but in large centers only. Thank you. Uh, may, may I have the, the, the next slide, please? Uh, so we're going to discuss a little bit the timing of drug administration in this uh, situation. We, we have the discussion around time of angio, but of course, uh, depending on the time of angio, uh, you have also the, the questions around the time of drugs. And uh, to start off, time of P2Y12 inhibitors uh, is a big issue, and, and uh, I would like to discuss this. Uh, 
I, I'm, not, I'm not going to discuss with you the time of anticoagulation or GPIs. Uh, we, we, won't, we won't have time for this. Uh, I, I don't think we, we would have time for ACE inhibitors. Uh, but uh, statins, high dose statins, I would like to discuss this with you. And maybe PCSK9 inhibitors. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so on, on this slide, you have the five randomized studies that looked at uh, uh, the timing of P2Y12 inhibitors across for Poisegrel, the very recent Dubios study published in JAK with Takagrelo, uh, stopped prematurely done in Italy. Uh, but it's, uh, it's still uh, 1,500 patients and, and no difference, just like in uh, the ECO study with Prasugrel. And we have had three studies in the past with Clopidogrel, uh, two uh, with a majority of ACS patients, Credo, uh, a, a negative finding again, and uh, uh, the Italian study again, Amida 5, uh, negative also for preloading. So uh, this is what we have. We, we don't have a single positive study for preloading or pretreatment. You may think that in the real life it's different, but when you look at all the registries, the big ones, for example, the Swedish registry published, published in, 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 in JAMA recently, it's exactly the same. And still, when we do the survey, and we have done the sur survey before this meeting, we still have 45% of the audience saying that they advocate early treatment with P2Y12 inhibitors. Only 14%, one four, would say lay treatment. So please tell me why we have such a disconnect be between the evidence and the practice. Over. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so interventional cardiologists like to do something and maybe to give an additional drug is at least something. But uh, no, seriously, I think um, the problems with the randomized trials <clears throat> is that all these patients went to the cath lab quite early. So within uh, your trial, Jill, within four hours. So and this is not what is uh, seen in clinical practice. Some patient will have to wait over the weekend. Some patient will have to wait at least to the next day. So I'm not sure that we can translate these results um, uh, to the uh, majority of patients. Clearly, if you have a system where you can provide early invasive strategy within the next four to six hours, there's no way that uh, uh, early P2 by 12 inhibition should be given. But if you have to wait longer, it, there might be a case for this treatment. Giovanni. Uh, uh, yes, I mean, to be, to be optimistic and, uh, you know, to be polite, I can tell you that, I mean, this is the reason why we did uh, with the GSA, the, the dubious trial is because, uh, you know, there was no study before that was uh, um, going to address this point. I think uh, we now have from literature and I think also this is the reason why the recent guideline changed. And uh, I think that in previously we did we still have some, you know, some reason to don't do that, but I don't think that uh, from now with the new guidelines and all data that we really have now, we can uh, do, uh, you know, not uh, not like this. So I I hope I'm uh, I hope that uh, in the near in the next future we will do that. There is uh, all the data that go in the in direction that you pointed out. So I yes. Think Things, things may change with the new guidelines. May I have the following slide for another difficult question, I believe. Uh, this is about statins, and we have had probably uh, 10 or 11 randomized studies looking at, you know, loading with high-dose statin before PCI, and a quite recent study, which is secure PCI, showing that when you load the patients with high-dose statins before PCI, especially in ACS and STEMI patients, you have a benefit. I, I wonder how many of us do that in, in routine practice, loading the patients two hours before PCI with a high dose statins. Giovanni, do you do that? No, to be honest, we do. We don't do that routinely. Only we do. Uber, Uber do you do that? No, we, we, we uh, are administering statins, high dose statins, on the first day, but 
I cannot say that it's always uh, before PCR. So we give it in the emergency department, but not on a routine basis. Jean-Philippe, what about uh, giving uh, 80 milligrams at Ovastatin two hours before PCI and 80 milligrams on the next morning as, as they did in secure PCI with good outcomes? Do you do that? Well, we, we try to do it uh, as uh, soon as possible, but not always before PCI, but uh, probably uh, it should be a, a good treatment to prevent uh, periprocedural MIs because, you know, the mechanism of this uh, complication is not always thrombosis. So we should use, you know, every means that we have, you know, to prevent this complication. So this is another disconnect that we have between evidence and practice. Uh, uh, next slide, please. We will have the same question, I believe, uh, for PCSK9 inhibitors, which is even more tricky. So this study will start uh, uh, next year, early next year. Uh, wh what is your, your bet? What, what do you think it's going to show? It's going to be a, a 1,600 patient study, uh, and, and these patients are going to be randomized to receive early evolucumab, just like in secure PCI. You know, before PCI, you are loaded with a drug which is able to reduce LDL very rapidly and possibly have other, you know, other <laughs> effects on inflammation, for example and the, the, the control arm will be standard of care. Do you think we, we may see something over? Um, it's an important study and I, 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 my best bet would be that it will be positive because you intervene quite early, you have a very uh, powerful intervention and if there's something about LDL reduction in this phase uh, and you have always, uh, always already shown the secure results, then it should work. Giovanni? Uh, I think it's, you know, according to the data that we have now for the pharmacodynamic data that, uh, you know, the, the PCSK9 uh, action, it's very, you know, nearly, uh, I think it could, uh, could address some of those, uh, those data. I think, uh, I mean, I will be optimistic for that. <laughs> 